Hello, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So, I'm wondering, why is there no White History Month? You know, I'm going to do a video on that very soon. You've got a Black History Month. You've got Asian Pacific History Month. Jewish History Month. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, uh, animal sexual, whatever month. You've got uh, Women's Month. you got uh, Hispanic Month. Native American Indian Month. How come there's no, you know, white people's month? Are white people evil? Uh, according to the news media, yeah, they are. And uh, when you find out that the six news corporations and who they're owned by and how they hate Jesus, well, you'll understand why there's no white history month. Now, in the Old Testament, the Bible calls for separation and segregation. Now, that's become a dirty word. Do you know that prior to the 60s, we had separation and segregation in this country? And then powerful forces went to work to break down those barriers. Now, I ask you a question. If God wanted everybody to be the same and all be the same race, color, whatever, wouldn't he have made everybody the same color? I mean, wouldn't he have made us all black or all white or all red or all yellow? But he didn't. He put differences. Now, does that mean God's a racist? Um... Uh, you know, some will actually have you to believe that. You know, he put the, uh, the Negroes in Central Africa. He put the Asians in Asia, you know, the Japanese in Japan and Chinese in China. And he put the whites in Europe. And he put the... Uh, you know, the American Indians and the Plains, and he put the Mexicans in Mexico, who are the direct descendants of the Aztecs. Matter of fact, Mexico City is built on the ruins of the Aztec Empire's capital. Mexicans are the direct descendants of the Aztecs. So, did God make a mistake when he separated all the people? Well, let's take a look. All right, get your King James Bible and turn to Genesis. Genesis is one of the most neglected books in the Bible. It is the foundation of the Bible. If you don't have a good foundation and you build a house... Guess what? The house is in danger of collapsing. You know, the foundation is where you put the walls on. And then you put the roof on the walls. And if you don't have a good foundation, well, guess what? Problem. All right, turn your Bible to Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Ooh. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Well, isn't there a bunch of preachers running around that say, Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord? But you don't do the things which I say. So evidently, we're supposed to do the things that Jesus says. 
Verse 47. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them. So you not only got to come to Christ, you got to hear what he's saying and you got to do them. This is Jesus. Don't argue with me. Argue with Christ. Hey, I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot me. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently. That means it beat strong. The stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently. Vehemently. Why am I having trouble with that? Vehemently. And immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Hmm. Now, who is this rock? I know the Catholics will tell you, well, the rock's Peter. Jesus told Peter he was the rock. Well, what does Paul say? In 1 Corinthians, and Corinth was a city in Greece, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. Matter of fact, let's read the whole thing. Let's go to verse 1. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love uh, Paul's writings. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, here it is. Paul is talking to a bunch of people in Greece and Corinthians that People who call themselves Jews today will tell you, well, they were a bunch of Gentiles. They're not Israel. But what does Paul say? Moreover, moreover, brethren. He's calling them brothers. I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers, our, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. What sea? The Red Sea. With Moses and Israel. How that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. The manna, right? And did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And that rock was Christ. And if you don't know this story, you need to read the book of Exodus. Because when God was leading Moses and the children of Israel out of Egypt, they passed through, under, they passed through the sea, the crossing of the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army drowned. There was a cloud. There was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. They got manna, that was the spiritual meat. And there was a rock that Moses struck that supplied water. And guess what? If you're in the desert, water is a very useful and handy thing to have. And let me tell you something, this water wasn't, this this rock probably, you know, it couldn't have been just dripping drips. It had to be a fountain, a, a, a huge fountain of water, because you're talking hundreds of thousands of, you know, probably over 100,000 people in the wilderness. 
That's a lot of water, people. That's a lot of water. So, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Hmm. He's telling the Corinthians that they were part of the Israel that went through, you know, with out of Egypt with Moses. How come preachers don't teach this stuff? Why? They don't want you to know. That's why Genesis and, and the Old Testament is so, so important. It's the foundation, people. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, what day? The day of the Lord, the day of Christ. Ah, uh, yeah, I know. There's people that will tell you that the day of Christ and the day of the Lord are two different events. But they're not. Because if they tell you the day of the Lord and the day of Christ are two different things, what they're doing is denying that Jesus Christ is Lord. The day of the Lord is the day of Christ. It's the same day. Okay? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And what name is that? Jesus. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Iniquity of sin, people. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. Uh, just so you know, I did an entire Bible study on the rock. It was probably an hour long. Um, it seems like I cover a lot of the similar material. I try to do this, you know, not so much for the older listeners that have listened to many of my studies, but for, you know, newer people. All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 3. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. You see, the men disallowed it. They didn't want it. But the stone was chosen of God. That's Christ, people. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accept, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now, I could make a, a whole study on just, you know. Well, let's read Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 real quick. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone. Okay. All right, let's go and take a look at the book of Genesis. Now, something you need to understand. The Tower of Babel or Babel. Babel means confusion. You ever heard of a baby babbling? And they call it, you know, uh, Babel, or Babel, was uh, where Babylon was built on, according to many scholars that I respect and believe. So, 
just remember something. The United Nations is nothing new. Why, in Genesis chapter 11, they, they had a United Nations back then. And before we had the United Nations, we had the League of Nations. So let's take a look. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So, I guess they were trying to build a stairway to heaven. What do you think? Just like Led Zeppelin sang about, right? And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language. And this they began, they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Can you imagine? You know, all the people, one language, one people, you know, they uh, sharing information. You know, that's what makes language is what a written language is what makes a civilization great. Because, let's say I was an expert on, I don't know, the book of Job. And I wrote an entire encyclopedia just on the book of Job. Well, you could get somebody else that, you know, I spent 30, 40 years, the book of Job. And I didn't, by the way. I'm not an expert on the book of Job. I'm just saying. Um, you know, I might spend 30, 40 years on the book of Job. And then somebody else comes along and he can read my 30 years of research and, you know, maybe 10 or 20, 30 hours. Well, that's, you know, that's, and then they, they build on your foundation. And, and that's how, that's how things work. I mean, do you realize the Wright brothers, uh, what, flew barely a hundred over a little over a hundred years ago. And then in World War I, um, they had, you know, biplanes and triplanes. And then by World War II, they had basically, what, 40-something years later, they had planes that would do 400 miles per hour in level flight. And by the end of World War II, they had planes, jets that would do 500 miles an hour. What do they got today? They got jets that'll do Mach two and a half, three. They got plane. They got jets. They won't. They don't even let us know how fast they go. You know. So. And the Lord said, "Behold, the people is one, and they have one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to. Let us go down and there confound their language." that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. The Lord scattered them. He separated them. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, or Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thenceforth did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, guess what? Babel was the place where Babylon, the 
the Bible says that Babylon was the, I think it, I forget the exact wording, but I think it said it was the, uh, the greatest of all the kingdoms. I mean, it basically conquered the entire known world. Babylon, King, King Nebuchadnezzar had basically conquered the entire known world. So, all right, let's take a look at the book of Leviticus. Now, Leviticus is the book for the children of Levi. They were one tribe of 12. They were the children of, well, children of Levi, the Levites. They were the tribe that God set apart. He separated them from the other 11 tribes. And he says, this tribe is going to serve me. They're going to be my kingdom of priests. They were going to serve in the tabernacle, in the temple. These were the people, you know, Moses, Aaron, they were the priests, okay? They were the ones that served the Lord day and night in the temple. God separated them. If King David would have went into the temple on the Day of Atonement and offered a sacrifice in the Holy of Holies, God would have struck him down dead. It was serious business being a priest. They spent, you couldn't even be a priest until you were 25 years old. You were trained from childhood until you were 25 years old. You had to come to the Lord his way. And he told you, you it's either my way or the highway. And that was, that was the thing. And if memory serves me correctly, you couldn't be a high priest until you were 30. The Lord wanted his high priest to have a level of maturity. And I'll tell you what, I remember how I was at 25, and I remember how I was at 30. By the time I turned 30 years old, I was actually starting to mature a little bit, quite a bit. 25, I was still party animal USA. All right, so let's read the book of Leviticus. Chapter 20, verse 24. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land. Whose land? The Canaanites. And if you don't know who the Canaanites are, I've got a playlist on the sons of God, who the sons of God are. Ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it. A land that floweth with milk and honey, I am the Lord your God, which hath separated you, which have separated you from other people. Ah, oh, I am the Lord your God, which hath separated you from other people? Ooh, I thought... We're supposed to get together and sing with Michael Jackson. We are the world. We are the children. No. I am the Lord your God, which hath separated you from other people. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean. And ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy and have severed you from other people that ye should be mine. Do you know what it means to, to sever? Uh, if somebody takes a sword and slices through your arm, they severed your arm from your body. That's what it means to sever. It means separate. 
Verse 27. A man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. You see, Satan worship was a very serious thing to the Lord. The Lord hates Satanism. And if you want to worship Satan, well, the Lord wanted his people to put those people to death. Today, we, we tolerate sin. You know, do you really think the Lord is pleased? Uh, you know, the people... When they wrote the uh, the Bill of Rights saying, you know, uh, freedom of religion, they were talking about if you wanted to be a Methodist or a Lutheran or a Baptist, you know, yeah, you got freedom of religion. But to be a Satanist? No. But today we just, we tolerate all forms of evil. They... God was serious about this. And a lot of people don't understand it. But there's going to be a whole bunch. How do I put this? God is bringing his curses upon the United States for tolerating this kind of evil. All right, let's go to, let's see, Leviticus. Let's go back a little bit. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 22. Ye shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments, and do them, that the land, whither I bring you to dwell therein, spew you not out. Ooh, do you know what it means to spew? It means to be spit out. You know, and that's the thing. If you, back, you know, Israel, when they didn't do the things that the Lord asked, he says, well, land's going to spit you out, basically. Verse 23. And ye shall not walk, in the manners of the nation, which I cast out before you. Ooh. Don't walk in the manner of manners of the nation, which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. Do you know what abhorred means? That's a $20 word that means hated. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. All right, let's go to book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means, uh, basically means second law. You had Genesis, you had Exodus, you had Leviticus, and then you had Deuteronomy, which is basically, it's sort of kind of a repeat of the book of Leviticus. But it's Deuteronomy, the second law. It's basically a second witness, okay? Chapter 32, in verse, starting in verse 6. Deuteronomy 32 and verse 6. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is he not thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. Yeah, people, you know, in Asia, they respect the older people. Because, hey, let's face it, we've seen a lot of things. You know, I don't claim to be smart. 
and at work they basically says, oh yeah, Bob's like an encyclopedia. He's you know full of useless knowledge. Yeah, you know the wisdom between uh, the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge just means you know a lot of things. Wisdom means you know what to do with that knowledge. You know, it's like you might know a lot about plants. Well, that's knowledge. But if you can grow the plants on a farm and make money, well, that's wisdom. That's the difference. You know, when you live a long time, you learn a lot of things. So, and you gotta, you gotta, you gotta understand something. I never spent a lot of time watching TV and movies. I, I, I never considered myself a bookworm. Nobody ever called me a bookworm. I was never a geek. I just was interested in things, especially history, you know? But in the United States, they disdain the elderly. You know, in, in Japan and China, they kind of, they almost revere the elderly because hey, you've seen a lot of things. You've learned a lot of things. And boy, I tell you what, when I was a teenager, I knew everything. Just ask me. I, I, I knew everything. And then when I got to be about 30 years old, I realized, hmm, dad wasn't so stupid after all. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. And by the way, that word nations is the same word that they translate in some places as Gentiles. It's the same word. Goyim. Okay? When the Most High divided, separated, when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So here it is. God divided the nations and he separated the sons of Adam. And he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. God separated the people. God did. God separated and segregated the people. You know, let's face it. You don't see bluebirds hanging around with a bunch of crows. And you don't see cows hanging out with a bunch of wolves. You know, it's like kind after their kind. All right, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 8, starting in verse 51. All right, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 51. For they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron. One of these days I'm going to finish the Iron Kingdom. But uh, the first people that in the Bible that are mentioned that played with iron were the descendants of of Cain. And some people say that the Canaanites were related to Cain. Matter of fact, in John 8, 8, chap, 8 chapter of John, John 8, and around verse 44, uh, Jesus traced a group of people back to Cain and then traced them back, you know, I, you know, you kind of wonder. Um, in the legends of Japan, 
you know, I don't put a lot of stock in legends, but you know, when it kind of lines up with the Bible, I kind of pay attention. In the legends of Japan, the Japanese have been making steel for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. They've been making samurai swords. They have a special type of sand on one of their beaches. It's an iron oxide. And they would melt it in a furnace and then put carbon. Uh, basically, you know, carbon is just burnt wood. And then they would beat it to beat the impurities out of it because the steel and the carbon would form a bond. And a lot of people don't know it, but steel is 10 times stronger by weight than appropriate iron. So you could have, you can make steel <laughs> really strong, as you know. I mean, that's what knives are made out of, right? So they would make these samurai swords. And they were among some of the ancient samurai swords are still to this day some of the best steel that they've ever seen in metallurgy. And uh, they were very labor intensive. They would fold it, fold it, fold it, beat it, fold it, beat it, fold it, beat it, until they beat out almost all the impurities. And all the molecules were lined up. And those things, I'm telling you, they were legendary for their strength, their flexibility, and their cutting edge. But they uh, asked the Japanese, well, how did you learn to do all this? And the Japanese have a legend that the gods came down from the sky and taught their people how to do this. And matter of fact, they teach that the family of the emperor is descended from the gods. Think Genesis 6, sons of God, daughters of men. I've got an entire playlist on that. And that's one of the, the most hated doctrines of the church today. But, you know, and then they'll say, ah, well, you're quoting the book of Enoch. No, no, I don't ever quote the book of Enoch. But a matter of fact, the book of Enoch does talk about the um, fallen angels coming down and teaching the women how to put on makeup and uh, how they taught people how to use iron and stuff. But here it says in 1 Kings chapter 8, 51, For they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron. You see, the Canaanites in the Old Testament wouldn't allow the Hebrews, the Israelites, to have iron or steel instruments. They had to, you know, they had to fight with wood. And, you know, you don't want to fight somebody with a, a, a steel axe when you're trying to fight them with a stick. That just doesn't work too well. But uh, according to the Japanese, some of those sword, samurai swords were over, they were thousands of years old. Thousands. I mean, when Europe was making, uh, well, not Europe, the Middle East, when they were making bronze tools, the Japanese had swords, steel swords. I don't know. All right, verse 52. So God brought his people, his inheritance, out, out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of fire, of iron. Verse 52, that thine eyes may be open unto the supplication of thy servant and unto the supplication of thy people Israel, to hearken unto them in all that they call for unto thee. For thou didst separate them. Who separated them? God. For thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth. God separated the people. For thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth to be thine inheritance 
as thou spakest by the hand of Moses thy servant, when thou broughtest our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord, from kneeling on his knees, with his hands spread up to heaven. Now the Bible says that Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. Sadly, he got into all kinds of witchcraft and uh, idolatry at the end of his life, but I believe that the, the by the very end, he came back to the Lord, and that's when he wrote the um, Proverbs. He said, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Vanity means worthless. You know, you ever hear the song, he's so vain, he's so worthless. You know, you, you, you spend your whole life building a house, and then you die. And then another lives in the house that you built. All the things on this earth that we do in the flesh are vanity. It's only that the things that we lay up, the treasures in heaven that are going to matter. Oh, let's see. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 17. Therefore I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule o over all my labor wherein I have labored, and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun, this also is vanity. Therefore I went about to cease, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. All right, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus speaking. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we're supposed to lay up treasures, our treasures in heaven. Very important. Now, here is something, oh boy, I'll tell you what, the demon nominational preachers will not touch the book of Ezra and Nehemiah with a 10-foot theological pole. They absolutely, it's as if this, this, these books don't exist. Now, I believe Ezra was the priest of the... Hebrews of the tribe of Judah when they came out of Babylon back to Jerusalem. And I think Nehemiah was the book, the king. Now, I could have that reversed. But Ezra and Nehemiah are parallel accounts of the same thing. One's from the book, uh, one book is from the view of the Levite priests, the other is from the tribe of the king. And Judah was to be the tribe of the kings, another separated uh, tribe of Israel. Levites were to be the priests, and the tribe of Judah was to be the kings. So you had basically two branches of government. You had the legislative branch, which was the king. No, I'm sorry, the executive branch, which was the king. And then you had the judicial branch, basically. The, God was the, the branch that, uh, the legislative branch. The Lord gave the law. 
and the priests were to make sure it was carried out. So basically, you had three branches of government, just like the United States. The, the king was the executive, the Lord was the legislative, and the um, judicial was the Levites. As, okay, let's go to Ezra chapter 9 and verse 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands. Ooh. The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Ooh. Let's go to Ezra, chapter 10, and verse 9. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the twelfth day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. And Ezra the priest stood up. I was right, Ezra's the priest. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives. Ooh, and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves. Separate yourselves. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. You see, God wanted them to, to, to separate themselves from these heathen, satanic people and from their strange wives. You see, the Lord doesn't want us marrying heathens. Heathens. Well, and guess what? I'm just as guilty as they were. Verse 12. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. Ever hear them saying, Oh, God hates divorce? Well, yeah, he does. But when you marry somebody you weren't supposed to marry, the solution was to separate yourself. All right, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 9. Now, I'm going to make this two parts because I've almost, I, it's, this is uh, already three quarters of, of an hour and I'm just getting started. Now, the book of Ezra, Nehemiah, records where the children of Israel intermarried with the heathens, people in the Old Testament that God forbid marriages with, namely the Canaanites. Now, there are people, matter of fact, the great majority will tell you, oh, well, you know, Christians, we're not Israel, so it, this doesn't apply to us. Well, how about Ezra chapter 9 and verse 6? And said, oh my God, I am ashamed and blush. I am ashamed and blush. B-L-U-S-H, to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses is grown up unto the heavens. Um, what group of people can blush? Well, before we answer that question, let's 
let's let's uh, let's figure out what people cannot blush. Negroes cannot blush. Impossible. Doesn't happen. American Indians, they don't blush. Doesn't happen. Okay. Um, Mexicans can Mexicans blush? No. The only two groups, racial groups of people uh, that can blush are like the uh, Chinese and the Japanese, the Asians, what they call the yellow race, and the Caucasians, the whites. And if you find a white, uh, a light, a white light-skinned girl, and you tell an off-color joke, or you ask her an embarrassing question or something of a sexual innuendo nature, oftentimes they will blush. There's only two races on the face of the earth that can blush. Let's read Jeremiah verse 6 and verse 15. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? What is an abomination? That's a sin that God really hates. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I shall visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. They were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Jeremiah 8.12 Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation shall they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Looks like it almost exactly. Almost exactly the same uh, words, right? Well, in 15, verse 15, it says, At that time, at the time that I will visit them, and Jeremiah 8, 12 says, in the time of their visitation. So basically it's the same language, but it talks about blushing. Okay? You know, why is all this hate white people rate uh, stuff? Where does this come from? I mean, you know, it's like, it's, it's extremely prevalent. Well, just remember, didn't we just read a while back where Paul told the um, Corinthians that they were, you know, with Moses when he crossed the sea, the Red Sea? Yeah. Is there a place that describes what Jesus looks like? Yes, there is. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 14. His. Who's his? Jesus, who is the Christ, his head and his hairs were white, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Now the black Hebrews will say, oh yeah, it's, it's woolly. His hair was like woolly, woolly, wool, wool. Well, yeah, well, yeah. His hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Well, then the, it goes on and it says his feet were as burnished brass. Well, you know, what happens when you take a white person and you stick them out in the sun? Don't they turn brown? Yeah. In Strong's Bible, Hebrew, Adam means white. It's a racial description. Adam, as in Adam and Eve. Hebrew 119, Adam, to show blood in the face, i.e. flush, to blush, to turn rosy, be made red, ruddy, to be able to blush. Hebrew word 120, Adam, from 
119. Ruddy means white. In 1 Samuel 17 and verse 42, And when Goliath, the Philistine, looked about and saw David, now David was a, a direct descendant of Christ. Well, Christ was a direct descendant of King David. Well, King David, uh, David was, uh, Christ was the root and the offspring of David. In other words, he was the great, 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 great grandfather and the great, 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 great grandson. Figure that one out. And when Goliath the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. For he was a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. Do you know what countenance means? It's, an, it's an, a middle or an old English word that means complexion. For he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance, fair complexion. Look it up in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Ruddy means having a healthy reddish color, a ruddy complexion, i.e. rosy red blush, as the Irish are ruddy. Let's read that again. And when Goliath the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. Hmm. Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. That pretty much puts a nail in the black Hebrew thing, doesn't it? Lamentations, chapter 4 and verse 7. Her Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. Whiter than milk, ruddy in body than rubies? Hmm. Okay. So was Adam the first white man? So that would make the Hebrews white, wouldn't it? And um, can any dark race blush or show blood in the face? So are you starting to understand why the unlimited third world immigration into the USA and Europe? I mean, after all, who printed the Bibles and built all the churches? Central Africa? No. Asia? No. Europe and the USA. They were the ones that built the churches and printed the Bibles. Have they done it perfectly? No, absolutely not. Let's read Ezra chapter 9 and verse 2 again. For they, who's they? Israel. For they have taken other daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed, so that the holy seed, what does it mean to have seed? Children, people. So that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespass. Well, if there's a holy seed, wouldn't that mean that there's an unholy seed? So why is there every race under the sun, but except for the whites, has got a history month? Why is that? Why is it you could have gay pride, Hispanic pride, um, black pride, Asian pride, but if you have white pride, you're a racist? What's up with that? Do you think the children of the devil don't know this information? Sure they do. Sure they do. All right, people. I am going to stop this study shortly. This is going to be part one. Let's read Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 15 again. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Nay, 
they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fought, fall at the time that I shall visit them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Hmm, interesting, huh? Blush. Tell an off-color joke to a decent Christian woman, and she'll blush if she's a child of God. You know, the whites are basically the only race that blushes for that reason. Now, you can take a Japanese or a Chinese and give them wine, and they'll turn red. They'll turn flush. So, is this why there's no White History Month? Think about it. Oh, and, and, and how come when you talk about this kind of stuff, uh, you automatically get ra labeled racist, racist? Why is that? You think Satan doesn't know this information? And this is not new information. I had a, a, a Bible theology book written in the 1890s. It had horse glue and leather uh, binding cover. And my dad's dog, she was like the sweetest dog in the world, a Doberman. She took it off the bookshelf and chewed it up. And she was such a sweet dog and she had been abused. Matter of fact, she had been, uh, he was, she was a rescue that my dad got. Um, turns out that some people owned her and they tried to turn her into a guard dog and they beat the crap out of her. And you, you, if you walked by and she saw your feet, she'd get up and run. If you picked up a newspaper or magazine, she'd run. Yeah, poor thing. I, you know, she chewed up my book. I couldn't bring myself to hit her. I just couldn't do it. You know, I was like, well, but this is not new information, people. This is what people believed back in the old days. This is what people believed. They believed that the Christians were God's chosen people from the beginning. And they weren't ashamed of being white. Now, I'm not proud of being white. But the Lord made me this way. I don't hate being white either. You know, I'm not going to be marching down the street uh, doing Heil Hitler with a swastika on my shoulder. No. Doing the Nazi salute. No. No, that's that's not what it's about. And personally, I think um, I, I have my doubts that uh, Hitler was sent of, of Satan to discredit this very information, but I don't know. All right, well, this is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the end of part one.